So I will talk about um, mainly deep learning on graphs. So this is uh, the main topic of my research, graph neural networks of different kind. But I would like to give maybe a, a slightly broader picture of overview about deep learning in general, what we call, uh, what we call geometric deep learning. Now I know that uh, this conference is supposed to be about healthcare, so I will also highlight some uh, uh, applications of these methods that uh, I'm involved in that, that are, come from this domain, especially drug uh, discovery and drug development. So I would like to open with this uh, quote uh, by uh, great physicist Hermann Weil, who uh, wrote a book about symmetry in the 50s, and he uh, called it uh, as narrow as you, uh, uh, or as wide as you may define it, it's uh, one idea uh, by which men through ages uh, try to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. And symmetry, the word itself, comes from Greek, so it was foundational to, to uh, geometries in ancient Greece, up to the level that Plato, for example, considered a symmetric object, what uh, we now call platonic solids, to be really the building blocks of the universe. And this is not far from reality if you consider how modern crystallography works. Now, uh, the first geometry, uh, the, the modern treatment of geometry, is uh, also due to ancient Greeks, uh, Euclid, in his elements, uh, defined what for more than 2,000 years was really the only geometry that was known. And there are uh, many attempts uh, throughout time trying to go beyond it. And uh, they were successful for the first time in the 19th century when uh, the, the monopoly of Euclid fell and uh, a, a zoo of different geometries emerged. And uh, it was at that point not clear even how to define a geometry and how to classify uh, basically which geometry is more general, which uh, is a particular case. And this new insight came from Felix Klein. So he was only 23 years old when he was appointed as a professor, starting his career at the University of Erlangen. And he suggested an algebraic approach to defining geometry as a space with a group of transformations that is attached to it. And for example, you can define uh, Euclidean geometry arising from the group of rigid uh, motions, or projective geometry, which was the more general one from uh, projective transformations. And rigid motions are a particular case. And this entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program even though Klein stayed there for just three years and moved on, eventually setting in Göttingen. But it was also, uh, not only mathematically, but also culturally, a uh, very big impact uh, in other fields, in particular in physics. And in physics, uh, it appeared that there is another zoo of different groups that you can use to define, basically, the properties of particles that we all uh, know. So uh, uh, you can, for example, take the transformations of space-time, what is called the Poincaré group, which uh, defines, uh, in the spirit of the Erlangen program, the, the Minkowski geometry, that, as we know, comes from the special relativity and used to formulate special relativity. But the big discovery of the 20th century in, in physics was the so-called uh, gauge symmetries from which the fundamental forces, maybe with the exception of gravity, arise. And this is really the, the physics that we know. So it all can be derived from, from uh, uh, first principles of symmetry, and the great result by uh, Amy Neuter was that with each of these symmetry groups, you can also associate a conservation law. So you can actually derive conservation laws uh, from first math mathematical principles. Now, uh, in deep learning, we also have a zoo of different things, right? We have different neural network architectures, whether it's convolutional neural networks, as Bart mentioned, or graph neural networks, uh, different forms of recurrent neural networks, transformers that are now very popular, and so on and so forth. And what is really the standard model of deep learning, right? Can we unify them in the spirit of the Erlangen program through some uh, fundamental principles? And we claim that such principles are the principles of symmetry and can really write a very general blueprint of deep learning uh, that it follows very closely the Erlangen program. And here we can talk about a domain on which our data lives. Uh, and on this domain, I, define, I can define its structure by defining a symmetry group that acts on points on this domain. We have data that lives on the domain on which this group acts uh, through appropriate group representation. And then we can define functions that uh, take as input these And uh, these functions could obey the properties of the symmetry group in the form of invariance and equivariance. We'll define it uh, uh, in a few seconds. And what we really show is that you can uh, derive standard architectures that are used in deep learning, whether it's CNNs, GNNs, uh, uh, some forms of recurrent neural networks, uh, LSTMs, 
as particular settings of this model by choosing the appropriate domain and appropriate symmetry group. And one classical example, of course, are convolutional neural networks. So here the domain is a plane, the symmetry group is translations, and then uh, data are images living on, uh, on planes or grids, and then uh, the equivariant functions are convolutions. So you can actually derive convolution from this first principle. Uh, another example that we'll be discussing today are graph neural networks. In this case, the domain is a graph. The underlying group is uh, the group of permutations, reflecting the fact that you don't have canonical ordering of the nodes in the graph. And then uh, message passing is a mechanism that is equivalent with respect to permutations. So I should say that uh, also mimicking the, the physical intuition in the past years, there is a, a popular type of uh, graph neural networks that have equivalent message passing. So in this case, we not only have the symmetry of the domain, but also symmetry of the data. So same way as in the standard model, we have uh, external symmetries, symmetries of the space-time, and internal symmetries that are symmetries of the, of the quantum fields. So these are exactly the, these, uh, this, uh, symmet the gauge symmetries of the, of the standard model. Here, in the same way, we can have the symmetry of the domain of the, uh, of the graph, and we also have symmetries, continuous symmetries of the data, such as rotations and translations. So this has become very popular in chemistry, where you can model molecules as graphs, but they are geometric graphs, so they, or they, their nodes have geometric realization, and therefore you can also subject these graphs to continuous geometric transformations. Now, why graphs are interesting? Because uh, you can model practically any system of pairwise relations and interactions as a graph, or at all scales from considering individual molecules to uh, interaction networks, what is called interactoms in, uh, uh, in biology, to entire social networks such as theater or maybe patient networks where you, for example, want to relate patients with uh, similar diseases. So at the microscopic level, uh, graph neural networks have been uh, already adopted in drug screening and discovery pipelines. So uh, one important uh, example of such work was um, the publication from uh, the group of Jim Collins at MIT, where they used graph neural networks in virtual screening for uh, new antibiotic compounds. And they showed that, that some compounds that, that were initially designed to be, for example, anti-diabetic drugs, such as halicin, have powerful antibiotic uh, properties. And this is a very important problem if you consider uh, a potential future epidemic coming from bacterial infections that are resistant to current antibiotics. So uh, we need uh, some efficient ways of discovering new compounds. So groundbreaking results, uh, AlphaFold 2, so that was the work of DeepMind, predicting the three-dimensional structure of proteins. As you know, proteins are the, the standard uh, targets for drugs. Uh, they are involved in practically any important process in our body. And AlphaFold is uh, uh, an equivariant transformer type ar architecture, so it's a geometric deep learning uh, architecture that uh, predicts uh, the folding structure from, from the protein sequence. So with my collaborators at the PFL, we're uh, using uh, geometric uh, deep learning architectures to actually build new proteins, what is called de novo design. And uh, in this case, we know how the target looks like, and we try to build the protein that will bind this target. Uh, doing this, we can address uh, potentially undruggable uh, targets that have flat interfaces that are hard to drug with, with small molecules, and we can drug them with a, a small uh, protein peptide or larger antibody molecules. Uh, and here you can see two examples. One of them is an oncological target, uh, the program uh, death uh, protein complex, so PDL1. And uh, you see a new protein uh, that was uh, designed and then its structure was confirmed experimentally that, that binds this target with high affinity. Another one is probably one of the most studied protein in the past couple of years, which is the, the, the spike protein of the novel coronavirus that ca causes the, the, the COVID-19 disease. And uh, here you can see a, a design binder that allows to neutralize the coronavirus. And uh, there are some uh, also experimental results. Uh, the structure uh, was confirmed with uh, with uh, uh, electron uh, uh, microscopy, cryo-EM. Uh, uh, and as well, we also did experiments with binding multiple variants of the virus. So you can see that it actually binds to, to different, uh, uh, different versions of the virus where the protein has slightly mutated, as well as a neutralization of a pseudovirus. And you can see here that, that we compare it to a baseline, which is a clinically approved drug from AstraZeneca, and well, we are not in the same uh, range of concentration and binding affinity, but still it's remarkable for something that was de designed completely uh, in a data-driven way. 
So it was not uh, designed in the usual experimental trial, trial and error uh, uh, way, I think, and much faster and much cheaper. I don't know how much AstraZeneca spent on designing their, uh, uh, their, their binder. Uh, ours was probably multiple orders of magnitude cheaper. So going to a higher level of abstraction, so talking about uh, protein uh, interaction networks, it is possible to use existing drugs rather than creating new ones, but for different purposes, what is called drug repositioning. And some pioneering work in this domain also using graph neural networks was done by Marinka Zitnik, who is now a professor at Harvard uh, uh, Medical School. And uh, they were uh, in this work predicting the side effects of using multiple drugs uh, in uh, combinations. We, uh, we used similar approaches uh, recently in a big collaboration called Recover that was uh, funded by the Gates Foundation and uh, involved several, uh, uh, several uh, industrial and uh, academic research groups, including the, the Miller group uh, of Yoshio Benjo, where we looked at uh, combinatorial uh, oncological treatments, trying to predict synergies of multiple drugs in different concentrations. So also using uh, graph neural networks as part of this screening pipeline. So these are actually uh, in vitro results. And uh, taking similar approaches to the domain of nutrition, uh, we could predict uh, potential anti-cancer or also antiviral effects of compounds found in food. As you probably know, food contains, uh, especially plant-based food, contains uh, compounds coming from uh, same chemical classes as, uh, as molecules used for, uh, for drug therapy, especially in, in cancer treatments. And this allowed us to create a map of different compounds and their uh, potential health uh, applications. We also collaborated with some uh, uh, star chefs that use these compounds to get a creative insight of uh, how future nutrition could work. So um, with this, let me talk a little bit about the core of uh, these and many other applications, which are uh, craft neural networks. So when I say a graph, I actually mean uh, the following mathematical construction. So uh, I will assume some simpler settings, but uh, uh, further generalizations are possible. So uh, we're talking about uh, nodes, right? So some points, right, that can represent uh, some entities, proteins, uh, patients, uh, anything, users of a social network, connected by edges. So we're talking about pairs of, uh, uh, of entities that are interacting with each other and we provide some features that describe the nodes of this graph. Okay? So we have some information that is attached to the features. So one important structural characteristic of a graph is that it doesn't really have a canonical way of ordering the nodes. So I can take uh, these uh, features and arrange them into uh, a matrix, and it can also represent the structure of the graph in the form of what is called the adjacency matrix, but it depends on how I numbered the nodes of the graph. So if I change this ordering, I will get uh, a different matrix, right? So basically, it is the permutation group that acts on these objects, on the matrix on, or, or, or the vectors that are defined on the graph. And this is really the, the, the fundamental group that, uh, from which we can derive uh, uh, graph neural networks. So the two typical tasks that are considered in learning on graphs are graph-wise tasks. So imagine uh, the application in chemistry where we have a molecule that is modeled as a graph and we want to predict some of its some chemical property of it, right? For example, how soluble it is in water, which is important for delivering drugs uh, actually into, into our body. Um, on the other hand, we might have node-wise tasks, or for example, think of a social network and we would like to find uh, users who are spammers, right? So we want to, to, to label nodes rather than the entire graph. And uh, in this case, we are interested in two different types of functions that we can compute on the graph. In the case of uh, uh, the example of molecules, we are interested in functions that no matter how we permute the, the input, the result will be the same. So these are permutation invariant functions. In the second case of uh, detecting spammers, for example, in social network, we want the function to change in the same way as the input changes. Right? So if I permute the input, the output should be permuted in the same way. So this is what we call permutation equivariant function. And graph neural networks implement usually a, a sequence of layers that are permutation equivariant, so all the network is permutation equivariant, and the output can be either uh, node-wise predictions, or we can aggregate everything in a permutation invariant way and produce an output for the, the entire graph. So the way that these functions on the graphs are computed are typically in the form of message passing. There are more general uh, ways as well, but this is the probably 99.9% .9 of uh, 
uh, all graph neural networks that, that, that work. So for every node in the graph, we look at its neighborhood. We take the features of the neighbors and aggregate them together with the uh, feature vector of the, of the node itself. And what is important to realize, of course, we don't have a canonical ordering of the neighbors, so this local aggregation function that I denote by phi must be permutation invariant. Now, if I apply that every node of the graph, and this can be highly scalable, right, because I can do these computations independently, I get uh, a function that is permutation equivariant, right? So I, I do this, uh, this, kind of, this kind of computation. And the choice of the function is extremely important because uh, it can be shown that if this phi is an injective function, we can formally relate message passing graph neural networks to graph isomorphism testing, what is called the vice ferrer lemon uh, test. So this is an algorithm that was devised in the late, eight, uh, in the late uh, 60s by uh, Andre Lemon and Boris Weisfeiler trying to test whether two graphs are isomorphic. It is actually interesting that the problem itself came from the domain of chemistry, so from early works, in particular pioneered by George Vladut. I think he was a Romanian uh, chemist working in the Soviet Union. And I got his uh, picture from his son, I think. Uh, is uh, unfortunately quite forgotten. But he was really a pioneer of what is nowadays called chemoinformatics. And um, chemistry, as you know, is one of the most data-intensive uh, sciences uh, from its very beginning. And one of the problems in chemistry is when you're given a compound, how to fast search for something similar. So uh, in the 40s, when the first digital computers appeared, uh, there was an entire trend to try to develop what is called chemical ciphers. So basically a linear code that represents uh, a molecule in the form of a string. The problem with these representations is that if I have a compound and uh, a, a part of this compound, right, like what is shown here, these ciphers usually will look very differently, right, because it doesn't preserve spatial locality in the mo molecule. So the insight of, of Ledots was to use uh, graph theoretical approaches, in particular graph isomorphism testing, uh, in order to determine whether two molecules are similar. And here approached Lemon and, and, and Weisfeller with this problem. So they acknowledge him in, in their paper. I should say that uh, chemistry and graph theory uh, are intimately related. Even the term graph itself, uh, at least in the sense that is used in graph theory, comes uh, from uh, chemistry. And it was Sylvester who introduced it in the, in the late uh, 19th century. Um, so the vice ferrer lemon test is an iterative color refinement procedure. So it starts with a graph where all the nodes are assigned the same label. And then it uh, studies the neighborhood structure of every node and uh, applies an injective function, so essentially hashes the, 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 the structure of the neighborhoods. And initially, for example, if we have neighborhoods of two types, a blue node with two blue neighbors and a blue node with three blue neighbors, they will be assigned to uh, distinct colors. We can repeat this procedure again, so now we have three distinct neighborhoods, but then at some point the colors will stop changing, so we can output the distributions of colors, and this will be a kind of a graph descriptor. So if I give you another graph and I get a different distribution, I can for sure say that they are not isomorphic, so they're different, right, structurally. But if the descriptors are the same, we don't know. So it's a necessary but insufficient condition. And you can find examples like uh, this very simple example of non-isomorphic graphs that will be deemed equivalent or potentially equivalent by the vice ferrer lemon algorithm. And it's easy to see why, because by considering the neighbors, you get uh, uh, indistinguishable structures. So these are rooted trees that are constructed by this algorithm. So there are multiple solutions. There is an entire hierarchy of uh, vice ferrer lemon algorithms, so you can go to higher order methods at the expense of uh, computational complexity. But the simpler trick that is used in, uh, the, in this literature is to do what is called positional encoding. So if you can pre-label the nodes of the graph in some way, even assigning random labels potentially, then you will be able to break these uh, regularities that, that confuse the vice ferrer lemon algorithm. Another possibility would be to detect structures that it cannot detect, such as triangles and rectangles, and provide them as features attached to the, to the nodes. So this is what we call structural encoding. Another issue that, that uh, comes frequently with graph neural networks is that the graph basically it, it plays a dual role. So it's part of the data, like in the case of a molecule, it fully describes the, the, structure, of, or, or the, the structure of the compound, but at the same time it's a computational device. So you propagate information on the graph. And it might happen that some graphs are very inefficient for propagation of information. Think of something like this, where you have a bottleneck, so you have one edge through which you need to pass all the information from one part of the graph to another. So it, it creates what is called over-squashing effect. And the standard approach to deal with it is 
graph rewiring. So you can change the, the, the graph that is used for message passing to make it more friendly for, uh, for this procedure. Now, another thing that uh, is also quite striking, at least to me, when you talk about geometric deep learning in general, and you look at graph neural networks as a particular case of it, is uh, other objects like grids or meshes uh, that, that are dealt with in geometric deep learning can be seen as a discretization of continuous uh, uh, entities. Right? So a grid, for example, is a discretization of the plane, or a mesh is a discretization of a surface or a manifold. But uh, graphs are not there somehow they are born as discrete objects, right? So what is a continuous analogy of graph? And uh, as a result, if you look at the kind of structure that we have in these objects, uh, or the kind of ambiguities or invariants, so grids are uh, probably the most structured objects, right? So we don't have any ambiguity. I can uh, label the neighbors in a fixed way, right? So I can talk about a neighbor uh, at my top or a neighbor at my bottom, left and right, and so on. In a mesh, I can kind of do it, but uh, the only ambiguity is the choice of the first node. Right? So we have rotation ambiguity. And in graphs, uh, any arbitrary permutation will work. Right? So it is uh, really uh, that graphs have the least structure out of all these, uh, all these objects. So the approach that we are trying to take, and that's the kind of metaphor that I would like you to have in mind for the rest of, the, of this discussion, is a physical system. So the graph uh, is a, uh, basically so there is some physical process that happens in some space could be the graph itself, the graph, or, or it can be something continuous of which the graph is a, a generalization. So here you can see uh, a, a system of mechanical oscillators at the nodes of the graph, and they are coupled by the graph itself. So you've probably seen these videos where you have metronomes uh, that, that uh, oscillate in completely different phases, but then they become synchronized if they stand on the same surface. So it's exactly an example of a coupled system uh, of coupled oscillators. So here the, oscillation, uh, the oscillations can be arbitrary, and the coupling functions can be more complicated, uh, parametric, and learnable. So in this case, uh, the uh, graph neural network is considered as a dynamic system. The layers of graph neural networks are discrete steps in time when we discretize this continuous process that is uh, uh, described as um, a partial differential equation. And uh, the graph itself, in some cases, can be considered as a discretization of some continuous structure of space. Right? So if layers are a discretization of time, the graph can be seen as a discretization of space. So out of these uh, different continuous models, the first one that comes to mind is the model of diffusion. So it is uh, natural to think of propagation of information on the graph as a diffusion process. And as you probably know uh, from classical uh, courses in differential equations, so uh, this is a mathematical formulation that probably goes back at least to Newton, his uh, uh, law of cooling that, that he published in the, uh, 1702, if I remember correctly, uh, is when you have uh, some medium, some object in which you have different temperature or in general different quantities of something, uh, then this, the gradient, right, the difference uh, creates a flux of heat or uh, matter, depending on the, the application. And uh, if you assume a conservation law that, that this temperature is not created out of nowhere and doesn't disappear, right, so we don't have sources, then uh, basically the change of the, the temperature in time is attributed only to this heat flux. It is given as a divergence of, of the gradient. And uh, this together gives us a diffusion equation uh, that looks like this. So we have some temporal change uh, of the temperature equal to divergence of the gradient multiplied by some function that I denote by A, which is the, the uh, diffusivity properties of the medium. So how different points conduct heat. And in the simplest case, we can assume that every point conducts heat in the same way, right? So the heat propagates isotropically and homogeneously. In this case, we get a very simple diffusion equation that actually can be analyzed uh, uh, very nicely. And you can show that the diffusion equation is the gradient flow of what is called in physics the Dirichlet energy. It measures the smoothness of a signal. And as you take it to the limit, the signal becomes, uh, becomes constant. Uh, you can also write, in the Euclidean case, uh, a closed form solution for the diffusion equation, convolution with a Gaussian, with, uh, with variance that depends on time. So again, as time goes to infinity, the, this Gaussian will become infinitely wide, and you will uh, basically you will diffuse everything. Everything becomes constant. But it's more interesting to consider uh, nonlinear diffusion equations where the diffusivity can be position dependent. So this is called uh, non-homogeneous diffusion, or even uh, direction dependent. So in this case, we have uh, uh, a tensor that scales uh, the, the gradient. So this is called anisotropic diffusion. 
And these kind of diffusion equations have attracted a lot of interest in computer vision and image processing community, starting probably with the work of uh, Perona and Malik, that uh, erroneously was called an isotropic diffusion. It is actually isotropic, but not homogeneous. And the idea is, if you want to do filtering of an image, right? So you can think of it as a diffusion process. So you have a noisy image. You, if you convolve it with a Gaussian, you will average out the noise, but you will also destroy the discontinuities in the image that are important for visual perception. And you can see it here in the, in the middle image here. So that's the result of the homogeneous diffusion. So the idea of Perron and Malik was to do a nonlinear adaptive diffusion that fills the, the edge. And this is done by uh, changing the speed of the diffusion by making it proportional, inversely proportional to the strength of the, of the image gradient. So the moment that the diffusion senses a discontinuity, it will uh, slow down or even stop. And the result looks like this. So you see that it removes the noise at the same time preserving the, the important properties of the, of the image. And an entire community emerged out of these ideas. So there are books and conferences about PD-based uh, 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 image processing methods or variational methods. It is actually a very elegant idea. Mathematically, you start with a functional that tells you how your image should look like, so some energy, and then you derive uh, the uh, diffusion equa the equation or other equations from optimality conditions, what is called euler lagrange equations. And um, it all has been uh, probably the predominant paradigm or one of the predominant paradigms in image processing. Uh, it all almost disappeared with the advent of deep learning for reasons that are probably similar to uh, why uh, all handcrafted features disappeared from computer vision. It's very difficult to come up a priori with uh, a functional or an equation that uh, would be suitable for any kind of data. And uh, what we are trying to do, we are trying to reincarnate these ideas. I think uh, a lot of ideas in deep learning have very short memory, so a lot of them are a reinvention of uh, some old ideas, maybe in some new flavor, but uh, we try to apply these ideas to graphs. And it's very easy to write a diffusion equation on the graph, so uh, uh, it essentially mimics the same uh, constructions that we've seen in the continuous case. So we have uh, the notion of the gradient, right? So it's just the difference between endpoints of, uh, of an edge. We have the notion of uh, uh, diffusivity, right? So it can be a, a scalar function that multiplies, uh, multiplies this gradient. And we have the notion of divergence. So you just sum the, uh, uh, the, the, the edges that uh, share a vertex. So basically, they, these are dual operations, right? So they're joint. So it, it, in short, it mimics all the, the continuous properties. You can also define the Laplacian on the graph. And uh, here we get a nonlinear equation. So uh, it is a system of coupled uh, ODEs, ordinary differential equations. They're coupled by the graph structure itself. So in order to solve it, you need to solve it numerically. And uh, the most straightforward approach would be to just discretize the time with some fixed step size that I call tau here. And uh, you get what is called the Euler uh, explicit scheme. And uh, not surprisingly, it looks like a graph attention network. So you can interpret um, the diffusivity function as attention. So in graph attention networks, this function is learnable. So in, uh, I will not go into these details, but uh, in more recent work, we actually show that graph convolutional networks can also be derived as gradient flows. So you have uh, something that looks like a generalized form of the, the, of the, uh, uh, of the Dirichlet energy on a graph. And instead of parameterizing every layer, like it is done in neural networks, you parameterize the energy. And then you have shared parameters, which makes the network much more efficient. Uh, but of course, there are some other, um, many other um, numerical schemes, so we don't need to stick to the, to the explicit scheme. There are uh, implicit schemes or semi-implicit schemes, uh, multi-step uh, uh, schemes such as runge kuta And the way that we use uh, the diffusion equation, we basically we start with some features on the graph that potentially can be also uh, encoded by uh, a nonlinear encoder, node-wise. Then we run the diffusion equation for a certain time, and the learnable parameters here uh, are in the diffusivity function. So basically, we learn the diffusivity function or, or the attention, and then we stop the diffusion equation and we read out uh, the, the node features that are produced. And this is an example of node classification. You can also do the same thing for, uh, for, uh, for graph classification or, or for edge prediction. And uh, it gives a new perspective on uh, old problems. So uh, we can, for example, study what happens uh, to uh, uh, phenomena such as oversmoothing when features tend to become uh, more and more the same on the nodes of the graph. 
We can analyze bottlenecks, as I will show later. We can see that many standard uh, graph neural networks can be formalized as a discretization of some continuous model. And uh, many uh, efficient numerical solvers that are common in the, the PDE literature have not yet been explored, at least to my knowledge, in this community. So basically, we have a lot to borrow from this literature by viewing uh, the problems of learning on graphs uh, in, this, uh, in this way. And there are many theoretical guarantees, for example, uh, alternatives to the uh, vice fair element hierarchy in studying the expressive power of graph neural networks. We can study the limits of diffusion type equations. I will show it uh, hopefully at the end. Uh, and deeper links in general to fields that are probably uh, less known in machine learning community, or at least in pr this particular community of learning on graphs, such as differential geometry and algebraic topology. So just to show you one example, so one of the problems, for example, in graph neural networks, because of a phenomenon called oversmoothing, it's generally considered to be difficult to develop uh, deep graph neural networks that apply multiple layers. But here, depth is not a problem because we actually don't have the standard notion of depth, we have the diffusion time. So the number of layers, right, the, the standard notion of depth in graph uh, neural networks or in neural networks in general uh, depends on how you discretize the time. So if you take bigger step sizes or you have adaptive step size, for example, or you have an implicit scheme, you can actually trade off the uh, accuracy for, for, uh, for the number of layers. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that, uh, so this is the discretization of time. We also want to consider the graph as a discretization of some continuous space. And if we go back to the uh, Euclidean diffusion in the plane, uh, if you look at the Laplacian operator, for example, right? So in the simplest case of uh, isotropic homogeneous diffusion, we have many ways of discretizing the Laplacian on the grid, right? So anything uh, that is shown here is a valid discretization of the Laplacian. Because it's a linear operator, I can do any convex combination of these discretizations, right? There are many other ways. So what I'm trying to say here is the choice of the graph is arbitrary. So it is some computational convenience, and uh, we would like to think of our graphs in the same way in graph neural networks. And uh, to do it, uh, we can again uh, look back at uh, works that have been done uh, almost 30 years ago now in uh, computer vision and image processing, considering instead of nonlinear uh, diffusion type equations, considering non Euclidean diffusion equations. And this was the work of uh, Ronnie and uh, his co authors, my PhD advisor. Uh, well, in the 90s, so 25, almost 30 years ago. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's quite old stuff, but I think it doesn't, uh, uh, didn't lose any relevance nowadays. So uh, in this case, you can consider the image as a manifold that is embedded in a joint space where you have uh, the, uh, the feature coordinates and the positional coordinates, right? So in case of images, the feature coordinates are just the color channels, and the positional coordinates are the, the x, y positions of the pixels. And by virtue of this embedding, we can pull back the metric so we can define uh, a Riemannian metric on this manifold, and with respect to this metric, we can write uh, uh, a Laplacian operator and a diffusion equation that uh, is called the Beltrami flow. It appears to be a gradient flow of a functional that is a generalization of the Dirichlet energy that is called the, the Polykov energy, and it's used in, uh, in high energy physics, in, in, uh, in particular in string theory. So uh, this is a non-Euclidean equation because this operator, the Laplacian, is now defined on a manifold. It depends on the Riemannian metric. It's called the Laplace Beltrami operator. And we can try to do the same thing for graphs, right? So here, the evolution, the, the, the evolution equation changes the, uh, both the positional and the feature coordinates. So we can try to do diffusion on the graph in the same way. So I mentioned positional encoding in the beginning. So we can think of a graph uh, having two types of uh, information. So we have the feature nodes, uh, the, 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 the feature vectors attached to the nodes that are come as part of the data, but we can also provide positional coordinates. If we embed the graph in some space, it doesn't need to be Euclidean space, typically graphs are better embeddable in hyperbolic spaces. We can apply an evolution equation to both of these coordinates. I denote uh, them by, by, by z here. And the evolution of the feature part of x is the feature diffusion, but the evolution of u, the, the positional part, is uh, some form of graph rewiring, because I can decide that if two points in the positional space come closer, I can create an edge between them, or if they drift apart, I can cut this edge. And I know that it sounds a little bit cumbersome, but uh, this picture probably shows it better. So here, uh, you can see a small example of a graph. 
So the uh, node colors represent the features, some low dimensional projection. The positions represent, uh, again, low dimensional positional encoding. And you see that the graph changes on the fly. So here the problem is, uh, is node classification. So there are uh, seven classes altogether. This is the core data set. And you see that as we evolve, uh, the clusters become more prominent and the graph also changes on the fly. And this is a little bit disturbing picture, at least for people coming from signal processing background, that you have a filter on your domain, but the domain is somehow evolving and changing under your feet. But this is a very common uh, approach in differential geometry, where you can take a, a domain, a manifold, a Riemannian manifold, and evolve it in some way. So by far, probably the most famous uh, such evolution equation is what is called the Ricci flow. So it is structurally similar to the diffusion equation. You can see that we have temporal derivative of, uh, in this case, this is the Riemannian metric tensor on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have second-order quantity, a bit similar to the Laplacian. This is called the, the Ricci curvature tensor. So what it does to a manifold that looks like a dumbbell, if we run this equation backwards in time, it will become more uh, sphere-like and then will collapse into a point. And uh, this mechanism was actually introduced by Richard Hamilton. It is named after uh, Gregorio Ricci Corbastro, an uh, early Italian differential geometer that uh, introduced the, 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 the Ricci curvature. But this mechanism was uh, introduced uh, in attempt to prove the Poincaré conjecture, which, as you probably know, is a topological result uh, conjectured by Poincaré, saying that uh, you can characterize a two-dimensional sphere by saying that any closed curve can be collapsed on it into a point. Right? You cannot do it on a torus. So if you think that this is a torus, right? so if I have a curve like this, it cannot be collapsed into a point. So he conjectured that high-dimensional spheres can be classified in the same way, and this was uh, triumphantly proven by Grigory Perelman about 15 years ago. That, that was uh, the, the, the breakthrough, and uh, exactly using the, the Ricci flow mechanism to, to, uh, for this proof. So what does it have to do with graph neural networks? In graph neural networks, I mentioned the problem that some graphs can be unfriendly for message passing, and in particular such graphs uh, happen to be actually very common graphs uh, that, that uh, occur in nature, in particular social networks, what is called scale-free networks. So what happens in these graphs is that the volume grows very fast. So if I look at the number of neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, they will grow exponentially. And as a result, if the problem requires long distance dependency, it means that I need to bring a lot of information from distant nodes, right, and I need to squeeze them into a single vector. And uh, this phenomenon is called over-squashing, and it's a kind of uh, insensitivity problem. So if I consider uh, my neural network uh, basically as uh, applying several layers, right, of Lipschitz continuous functions, and I want to see how the change of the input in some node that is distant from the output node, let's call it i and s, uh, how the small change in the input affects the output, I can actually bound it by some, uh, by some numbers. So here, alpha and beta are the Lipschitz constants, so they define how the, the layers of the graph neural network look like. But here comes uh, something that depends on the structure of the graph. So it's some power of the normalized adjacency matrix. And intuitively, we expect that there will be some better cases and some worse cases. So better cases, for example, will be grids, right? We, we do encounter our squashing in sequential models, but uh, it is far less pronounced than what happens, for example, in trees. So trees are a pathological example with exponential volume growth, right? So we need some kind of more nuanced analysis that will be able to tell apart structures like grids and structures like trees. And that's exactly what the curvature was invented for, right? So in differential geometry, you can tell apart uh, different uh, Right, uh, objects by looking at uh, how geodesics shoot from, um, that are shot from two nearby points, whether they converge, remain parallel, or diverge. Right? So this, uh, uh, in the first case, we have a positive curvature, so it characterizes locally a sphere. In the second case, we have uh, a flat geometry, so it's Euclidean geometry. And in the, uh, in the last case, it's uh, hyperbolic geometry with negative curvature. So you can define something similar for graphs. We can take uh, nodes connected by an edge and see if we tend to form triangles, so click-like objects will have positive curvature. Uh, if we form rectangles, then they look like grids, so they are supposed to have zero curvature. And if they diverge, right, so we have no triangles and no rectangles, then it looks like a tree. So without going into two, two details, we can define uh, a discrete version of edgewise uh, Ricci curvature. We call it balanced form and curvature that mimics the continuous behavior, so we'll have clicks assigned uh, positive curvature, grids having zero curvature, 
and trees having negative curvature. And what we can show is that uh, if we have a graph with uh, negatively curved edges, then this constant that, that bounds the sensitivity, right, the Jacobian of the, of the graph neural network, that tell us that there is a, a problem of over-squashing will be small. So in other words, we can attribute the over-squashing phenomenon to negatively curved edges. And once we understand it, we can do uh, a smart graph rewiring that surgically changes the graph by uh, touching on the edges with negative curvature. So we can remove some of uh, these uh, unhappy edges. We can replace them maybe with uh, some edges that increase the curvature. And this provides a graph rewiring that doesn't affect dramatically the structure of the graph, but makes the graph much friendlier for, uh, for message passing. And as a result, we show that in particular in heterophilic cases, where the, the nodes, uh, the, the neighbor nodes, are, uh, have dissimilar labels or fishes from, from, uh, from, my, uh, from my own information, uh, it improves significantly the, the output of the learning. So this was uh, a paper uh, that uh, was done by my PhD student, uh, Jake Topping, and my postdoc, uh, Francesco Di Giovanni, and uh, it was an honorable uh, best paper mentioned at iClear, and obviously we're very happy. So you know, obviously when you have a paper on Ricci curvature, the best way to celebrate it is with a bottle of champagne from uh, Ricci Corbastro, which is actually from the same family of Gregorio Ricci Corbastro, the uh, uh, famous Italian winemakers. I think the, the, the wine is junk, but just for the name. So uh, the last thing I would like to mention is maybe some more exotic stuff, so I promised algebraic topology, so here it is. We can uh, start with the graph, but equip it with some more structure that uh, technically is called the cellular shift. So uh, maybe making an analogy to, to manifolds in differential geometry, so a manifold is purely topological object, right? So roughly speaking, you have the notion of neighborhood, but you don't have notion of distance or angle or direction. So uh, how do you give geometric structure to a manifold? You uh, give what is called, you define what is called an affine connection. So it's a way of telling how to move vector from one point to another. So manifold is locally Euclidean, so every point is associated with what is called a tangent space. Uh, and if you describe a Riemannian metric, then there is a special connection called the levi civita connection that is a kind of canonical one. So uh, basically, the connection allows you to move vectors from one point to another. So we can do something similar on a graph. We can assign a, a, a vector space to every node and every edge. We can, uh, we can define maps, what is called restriction maps. So these are linear transformations that take vectors uh, from uh, one such space to another. And we can uh, also restrict these maps, for example, to be uh, orthogonal, or to be, uh, to be diagonal, or to be, to be certain class or even certain group. And uh, we can define a diffusion equation with, uh, on this shift. Uh, so the shift itself can be learnable from the data. And what is interesting is that it allows us to, uh, to talk about the discriminative power, the expressive power of graph neural networks by looking at the limit of the diffusion equation. So we ask if we restrict our shift to be within certain class, how many, for example, classes of nodes we can, we can distinguish in the limit. And this is a nice alternative to the weiss fehr element hierarchy because the weiss fehr element hierarchy has a lot of limitations. For example, it doesn't uh, allow to, to uh, incorporate graph rewiring, right? Because it uses, it relies on the structure of the graph to do message passing, whereas uh, we know that, that in modern graph neural networks, we actually want to do graph rewiring to, to deal with pathological cases such as, as bottlenecks. So I think it's uh, a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, uh, thing to look at it from this perspective. So, of course, uh, looking at the limit is uh, nice theoretically, but in practice we never run the diffusion to the limit. So it would be more interesting actually to look at finite time diffusion. And here is probably where uh, learning on graphs or learning in general can be considered as a kind of controlled PD, so we can use optimal control theory to understand, for example, whether we can reach a certain state of a system in certain time. So we can talk about efficiency, not only uh, expressive power. Uh, and I mentioned uh, this uh, picture in the beginning, so uh, I will finish with it. So we don't need, of course, to consider only fusion type equations. So here's a recent work that we presented at uh, ICML earlier this year that was done with colleagues from ETH Zurich where we uh, consider a system of coupled oscillators. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a second order uh, differential equation. It has a kinetic term. So uh, the behavior is very different from diffusion. It, it is oscillatory. And apparently for certain types of problems on graphs, uh, this is actually much better. So if you think of, for example, computing shortest distances, Dijkstra type, 
methods. So these are wave equations, right? So these are not diffusion equations. Uh, even though there are some claims that, that at least on meshes you can, you can do everything with, with diffusion. So just to finish, I think it's, uh, it probably brings an interesting new set of tools and interesting new perspectives uh, to this field of graph neural networks that traditionally has relied on uh, discrete combinatorial constructions. I think by casting it as continuous systems, as, uh, 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 as partial differential equation, and discretizing it in, uh, in certain ways, we can leverage uh, a lot of results that exist in this literature that, that so far have not been uh, yet explored. <laughs>